one thing that's important for consultants to remember is that clients generally aren't looking for the best solution. They're merely looking for a reliable solution. Hey, welcome to Unleashed, the show that explores how to thrive as an independent professional. I'm your host, Will Bachman. Unleashed is produced by Umbrex, the first global community connecting top-tier independent management consultants with one another. I'd like to welcome Rona P. and Felicia Z., who recently signed up to receive the weekly Unleashed email, which includes a summary of each episode, transcript of each episode, and bonus materials. If you'd like to receive the email, send me a note at unleashed at umbrex.com. We just heard from today's guest, my good friend, David A. Fields, who has been a regular guest on this show. If you've been listening from the beginning, you heard David on as my very first guest on episode 001, where we discussed his book, The Irresistible Consultant's Guide to Winning Clients, Six Steps to Unlimited Clients and Financial Freedom. It's my top recommended book on independent consulting. I've given out about 200 copies of that book. David was also on episode 170 on how to make outbound calls. It's on episode 172 about how to set up a CRM system. I'm regularly recommending that episode to folks. And episode 190 on what makes for a successful consulting partnership. In today's episode, David and I riff on tips to increase the chances of converting a possible consulting opportunity into a confirmed project. Definitely buy David's book if you haven't already, The Irresistible Consultant's Guide to Winning Clients. Check out his website, davidafields.com. I love his weekly blog posts, and if you visit his blog and scroll down, you can sign up to get his blog posts delivered right to your inbox. It's the first thing I read every Wednesday morning. Hello, David. Welcome back to the show. Well, it is always so much fun to have conversations with you. Thanks, David. It's it's really great having you back. For listeners, we've been on and David's been on, you know, several times before. Episode 001, the very first episode of the show. And then there's several other episodes we had you on, talked about CRM systems. Uh, we talked about how to make outbound calls to clients. Those are really popular episodes. And uh, so today I'm really excited to have you on the show to talk about how clients pick consultants. And you wrote a whole book on this. I did. (laughs) Back before I was working with consultants directly. It's actually how I ended up working with consultants directly. My business used to be really working with corporate clients and helping them structure projects correctly and then bring in the right consultant. Yeah. So let's talk about that. So we've talked before about, you know, your, your most recent book, The Irresistible Consultant's Guide to Winning Clients. And I've given out you know, 700 copies of that book because I love it so much. I'm always recommending it. Um, But let's talk about how clients should go about picking a consultant. So take it from the top. How should clients think about structuring that? It's useful insights for us as consultants to to know how a really thoughtful client will approach this um, this problem. Well, um, so you actually bring up a really interesting question. So I'm going to, be, before I answer, I'm going to ask you a question. All right. Which is, will it be most helpful to understand how clients do choose consultants or how they should choose consultants? <laughs> because they're not exactly the same. That's, I guess, I guess that's true. <laughs> Why don't we do a little bit of both? And, okay. uh, you know, I mean, so, I mean, so in terms of how, I mean, w- one way we can all approach of how, you know, they do pick consultants is reflecting on our own experience, right? Of picking professional service providers for ourselves, whether that's an attorney or an accountant or an insurance broker or a bookkeeper. It's, you know, you'd probably ask a bunch of friends or, you know, people that you know, hey, I'm looking for, you know, a back surgeon or an accountant or whatever. Do you have any recommendations? And then, (laughs) you know, you kind of like see if they have a website and you know, ask them a couple of questions. Maybe you meet with them and you kind of pick someone that you like, right? I mean, but um, how, how do how, what your experience is much vaster? <laughs> let's do both parts. How do clients actually pick consultants, and how should they? But let's start with the first okay. part. How do they? Yeah. All right. So um, yeah. So let's spend some time on that. And and obviously, I've done a fair amount of research on this. And of course, my whole business really the uh, was was this where I was 
on the one hand, um, a consultant, so working with, with clients, but really I was also the client on every project because I was finding the consultant and, and playing the role of choosing the consultant with the, the clients. And so w- what I saw, what, what clients actually do is, and the, some of the research on this is absolutely irrefutable. I mean, it just is, is consistent. And what, what they do is the very first thing that a, a client does is looks for situation expertise. Meaning, most specifically, I want someone who's an expert in my industry, you know, which, which intuitively makes some sense. And we do that also, right? You say, well, I, you brought up the idea of a back surgeon. Well, you want someone who's, who's well, you go, I, I really want a back surgeon because my back hurts. So I want a back surgeon that works with um, you know, middle-aged men. Uh, you know, and if it was middle-aged men who look exactly like me, that'd be even better. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and that's what, that's what clients do. They, they're looking for someone that has the expertise in their situation. And ultimately, of course, the driver of choice for consulting is trust. So you're, you're, the, the cons- uh, clients will always say, either explicitly or inside, who do I trust most? Who do I think is actually looking out for me? Has the, given me the greatest likelihood to succeed and the least likelihood to make me look terrible <laughs> or to deliver a bad result. You know, those, those three pieces, that's the trust triangle. And, and at some level, they're saying, who do I trust most? And the way they get to trust is saying, well, have you worked with people like me in situations like mine? And do you seem credible? And do you seem reliable? And now on top of that, they stack things like, do, do I think you're going to be easy to do business with? And uh, often that turns into could I just use you for everything? So will you be a one-stop shop? And uh, also, by the way, do you cost the least? And some clients, as we all know, we've all encountered, some clients are very, very cost sensitive and they're looking at it from a cost standpoint. And so those, those sort of factors, that situation expertise and ease of doing business and cost, that is what drives um, of, of huge portion of how I actually decide um, and, and what they do. It's not necessarily what they should do, but it is, it is how clients tend to choose. Um, and when we know that, I mean, then we go back to all these other discussions you and I have had, Will, about, well, then how do you build trust? How do you make sure that you are the most, you're seen as the most credible? Um, why it's important to actually have a focus on an industry? Well, you know, that's what clients are looking for. How do you make yourself appear and actually how do you make yourself easy to do business with? Yeah. All, let's, right? let's, All of those pieces. Let's dial it back even a little bit more. So um, okay. you kind of looked at the screening criteria, but in your research, how do clients in reality actually even come up with the kind of possible set of people that they're looking at? Ooh, you know, do they start question. with a just asking friends and relatives is it with a Google search? Is it yeah. with a LinkedIn yeah. search? So how, how are you seeing that clients actually identify the, the set of three or five or 10 or 100 people that they will screen? Yeah, you know, it's rarely 100. Yeah. Um, you know, so there's sort of two versions of this. One is the executive who says, you know, I'll find the consultant. And that search is pretty, pretty minimal. It tends to be, who, who have I encountered in the past? Or if I trust someone, an, a colleague, a peer, who have they used? So I'll, I'll call the uh, member of the board of, a, of another firm where um, I'm on the, you know, we're, we're similar on boards. Or I'll call uh, a VP. If I'm a VP, I'll call a VP somewhere else or someone, another VP in my firm in a different division and say, who have you used? Mm-hmm. So it becomes just sort of a, who do I know and who do my friends know or people I trust know? Yeah, or maybe that, that's, or maybe like who presented at this conference that I went at, right? That seemed to know what they're talking about. Yeah, that will sometimes that will sometimes happen. It actually happens less than probably all of us would wish, mm-hmm. but it does. But that does happen um, in part because senior executives uh, go to conferences less than we'd wish. Mm. Um, but that but that certainly can come up. Or I've read a book by someone. You know, maybe they'd be helpful. Right, but there, the, the, so sort of different situations. One is I have a problem. Who can help me solve the problem? The other is, oh, I've encountered a really interesting solution. On whether we wonder whether we could use that here. Mm. Right, and in that case, there's not a search for a consultant. There's simply an approach 
to a certain consultant and saying, hey, could you help with this? Mm -hmm. Um, So if someone has an ongoing issue and they're keeping their eye open or they do a little bit of research or do some reading and who's written the book on it, uh, that will that actually can fill out the competitive set. There's a whole nother version where the senior executive, the decision maker delegates the finding to someone. Mm -hmm. And then you're more likely to get into a Google search. Uh, Again, all this depends on the size of your client. Right. If you're dealing with a, a multi-billion dollar multinational client and at the top of the organization, they if they delegate it, then you've got someone doing Google searches and, and literature searches and, and all of that. If you're if you're dealing with clients that are uh, local mom and pops or you're dealing with a 20 million dollar company around the corner, they don't have anybody to delegate it to. So they're much more likely to do a short search. Um, ask them friends. And then can just play back again for me. So, you know, so you yeah. identify the set and maybe it's two or three or five names that they come up with by asking their friends or VPs in other divisions or some chairman of some other company that they know. Sure. And then how are, how do clients like actually decide, you know, in terms of, you know, maybe they ask each one of them for an hour phone call and explain their issue and they hear a pitch or something, but then what's really kind of driving the choice? Well, again, ultimately what's driving that choice is, is this, is this idea of trust yeah. is this belief that someone's not going to screw up or someone's going to deliver the result. Yeah. And as I mentioned that that's because they've, they've, maybe they've done interviews They've done gone to websites and they're looking for, have you worked in my industry? That is w- w- the number one criteria hmm. uh, comes up in all the research. And so they're looking for, you know, are you, are you a specialist in my industry? And w- if you're a specialist in every industry, that's less powerful. They're going to look at your website and see, where do you play? And they may get you on the phone and say, where do you play? And it's, possible they will in competitive situations that they'll they'll bring in two or three people or talk to two or three people um in a, in a larger project they're going to bring in two or three folks and invite them to pitch or invite them to do a capabilities presentation i mean the vast majority of consulting projects are not competitive they're they're really the client has has done a whatever looking, whatever minimal amount of looking up front, and then has decided, you know what, maybe, maybe I'll look at two or I'll talk to two or three mm-hmm. consulting firms, but it's not like they're bringing in 10 or 20 or a hundred. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and it's often kind of more of a satisficing than a yes. optimizing, right? Where you're not necessarily Absolutely. looking for the best single person in the world, but you know, someone who probably seems reasonable they look, you know, they seem trustworthy. I've worked with them before. Someone recommends them to me. They seem to know what they're talking about. Okay. Yep. yep. Let's go. Because that's, that's absolutely right, Will. One thing that's important for consultants to remember is that clients generally aren't looking for the best solution. They're merely looking for a reliable solution. They just, they, they want a solution. They want their problem fixed. Whether it's the ultimate, ideal, super fix or not, or the most innovative, you don't care, especially if you're fixing a problem as opposed to achieving an aspiration. I mean, I have a, a leak up by my chimney in the house. I've had a, the, almost everything replaced. The only thing left to replace is the sky. I <laughs> don't care, actually, whether the, uh, someone comes in, they've got the most innovation, innovative idea or not. I just want the leak to stop. And that's the case for, for most of our clients is they don't care whether you're the most innovative or this or that. They actually want you to just be reliable and credible. Yeah. And as you said, that's a satisficing mentality. And and I think you're absolutely right, Will. Yeah, reliable and credible. I I would add to that, that, uh, you know, and I'm in the position where, you know, occasionally I'll sit in on discussions with a consultant, you know, having a discussion with a client. So I kind of get to observe this a little bit. Yep. Bird's eye. And some people do this well, but a lot of consultants don't, which is, the, you know, just the right out of your book, the Irresistible Guide, uh, Consultant's Guide to Winning Clients, uh, about doing a context discussion where yeah. I often see people 
doing a lot of stating and a lot of you know talking about their past experience. And while you do, while you say that reliability and credibility is important, my my belief is that mostly clients don't care that much about what you've done in the past. You know, they just not that interested in it. What they really want to know is what are you going to do for me, right? And when I see consultants talking so much about their past experience, they're often neglecting to like ask the the right questions to get a full understanding of the context. Like Yeah, well you're absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah, you're you're hundred percent right. The the credibility and the reliability and the industry experience and all of that, that gets you in the door. Yeah. So you're asking, you know, what do they look for? That's what they look for first. It won't win you the project. What it will do is it gives you the right to play for the project. Yeah. I think once you're in the and door, you, you then you don't need to prove that anymore. Now you need to make sure right. that you can actually understand what the problem is. And sometimes people will be so eager to keep proving that, like, I've done this you know, here and we got this result, that they don't ask, okay, what does a client really trying to achieve? And it's, you know, yep. you're, you're part about the context. Of why are you doing this now? You know, like, who who is involved? What are you trying to accomplish with this project? You know, r- remind me some of the other pieces of the context discussion. So the context discussion, six pieces. I'll run through really super quickly. Yeah. So the situation and the two key questions in the situation are why now? So what's changed? And why are you going to the outside? So why not just do this yourself? And then desired outcome. What does better look like? And, uh, and often clients haven't thought this through. And then indicators of success. How will you know when you get to better? Because if you don't know that, how will we know along the way if we need to make adjustments on the project? What risks and concerns? That's part four. What concerns do you have? What concerns do you have about the project? What could make it fail? What concerns do you have about bringing a consultant in? What concerns do you have about bringing us in? Right? This is a, uh, probably of, of the entire context discussion, those risks and concerns are the most important um, in terms of actually winning a project. Then you have value. So why bother? And by the way, if you ask me how should cons- uh, clients go about choosing a consultant, the very first thing they should do is ask, why bother? Why are we even doing this project? Mm-hmm. What's the value? What's the meaningful impact this will have on you, your business, your customers, or your employees? And then the final part of the, the context discussion is parameters. So people, time, money, it can be uh, geography, it can be gender. I mean, I've seen all sorts of things affect it. And yes, a well-constructed discovery process, that's a context discussion, will win you the project. To get in the door, though, usually you, the client wants to see that situation expertise, which can be a little frustrating because it's actually not necessarily that important. Yeah, but to fight it is futile. Yeah, <laughs> and I think there's a question or a series of questions that are embedded in your context discussion that are around, like asking the client, well, in your kind of mental model, what does this project look like? Like, what do the phases of this yeah. project look like? You know, how do you how do you envision like what kind of team are you looking for? What kind of support are you looking for? And asking them to just explain what they're what kind of support they're hoping to get so often uh, consultants will try to be the expert and say oh well this is what you need or this is you know we will come in with this engagement manager plus two team and this is going to be four months and we'll you know we'll look at every you know kind of laying out some grand scheme and really what the client wants is no actually i just wanted like a one week quick diagnostic or something and i can handle it from there and if you don't ask the questions around that, like kind of what's your mental model of how big this is? Is this like a one week? Is this two months? Because often some, you know, you could imagine there's a range of ways to get at something. You could do a one day workshop, you could do a two week diagnostic, you could do a three month strategy effort. And sometimes people just aren't aren't asking what the client wants to buy. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And that will come up all throughout. Usually when you're saying, you know, what does success look like? Often clients aren't thinking of the outcome. They're right. thinking of the of the process. Well, success looks like a two day, you know, a, a two day workshop where we de- de- deliver our strategy or develop our strategy. And you're thinking, well, okay, success is not a workshop. <laughs> that's, that's just one means to get there. Um, so you'll get it from there. You'll get it when you're asking about budget, when you ask the heart attack question, 
that will start to get you towards that. But yeah, it's all, um, discovery. That's the heart of becoming the obvious choice. Yeah. Right? It's not about, you don't become the obvious choice by saying, here's what we're great at. You become the obvious choice by understanding what does great look like for them? And what are their concerns? How, all of that, by the way, all of that goes back to the original point of trust. Mm-hmm. When you understand a client so well, better than any other consultant and better perhaps than they understand themselves, you're able to put forward a solution that they can trust because it meets their concerns, because it addresses what they're really looking for. That becomes an, an easy, easy uh, sort of win because you've addressed their concerns because you've, you've reassured them that you'll be able to achieve the outcome they want. Yeah. You know, and again, the, the, the only thing is, that, again, the frustration for many consultants, both small and, and large, is to get in the door. They're saying, I want you to have situation expertise. Yeah. You know, I think one way to build trust is to get real work done in the first meeting, in that kind of context discussion, you know, discussion, right? But to actually get something accomplished. And I know that some consultants will express this concern. Well, if I kind of give all the jewels away up front, you know, they're, you know, they'll get all this yeah. value out of me and they won't want to hire me. But if you can actually problem solve and rather than just talking about your background, actually, you know, move it forward and maybe put together a kind of um, some kind of hypothesis tree or issue tree in that first meeting and, and create that together with the client so that at the end of the hour, they're further along towards solving the problem than when you, when you walked in the door, you actually get something accomplished, then they've experienced what it's like working with you, then I think you're well along the way to, to, to confirming the project. Yeah, I, absolutely right. I, I was talking with one of my clients is a smallish firm. At this point, they've got about 20 people and down in Virginia, and they're going into, they're actually going over to London to talk to a pharma company on Monday. And so they called yesterday to ask this, this very question. They said like, well, we're going to be in there in 90 minutes. What if we kind of give away everything and they don't want to hire us? <laughs> and my reaction to them and, and my advice to them is if a client can get everything they need from you in a 90 minute conversation, they were never going to pay you half a million dollars or a million dollars anyway. <laughs> um, right? So don't worry about that. Yeah. And in, and in fact, the opposite is true. The more you give, the more likely a client is to say, holy cow, whatever, first of all, they're not going to remember everything you give anyway, and they're not going to be able to implement everything you give. What they're going to see is you have a lot to give. And whatever you can give in an hour, I mean, you know, Will, you and I talk all the time, and I'm, you know, I learn from you constantly. If you talk with me for an hour and I, and I sucked up everything, I'll, I'll, my biggest impression would be there's got to be 500 more hours of learning to get from you. And, and that's how clients react to, you know, so be generous and you're right, create real value while you're together. And the right questions, I think, create value. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, if you can you know, actually solve their problem or answer their question in, in just the 90 minutes, and even if they were willing to pay you, know, pay you 100000 or half a million to do the two-month project to get to that answer and you give it away in 90 minutes, like what? You know, life's too short. Just, you know, so maybe they don't hire you for this one, but who are they going to call next time, right? Exactly. And, and what kind of, you know, if you can solve it in 90 minutes, really, did you need to do a two-month project? Yeah, exactly. What are you, what are you going to do for two months? <laughs> you know, exactly. It may be two months of implementation. Yeah. It may be two months of, okay, now let's take this idea. This, this idea is the answer, but how do we actually make the idea work? Well, that's what you hire us for. Yeah. Now, another, Not just the insight. Yeah, I mean, another right, point on. is, and this could be contra- you know, controversial or maybe it's even stupid, but I think going in and over over preparing but then being indifferent to results so if you you know over prepare and like research the client understand the situation as much as you can ahead of time but then don't be too caught up on winning that particular project and in some cases being willing to say you know what we're not the right we're not the right you know person to help you with this particular thing or we're not the most efficient solution like recently I had a client that was willing to, you know, to hire my firm to do about a month's worth of work. And I said, you know what, we could, but there's this report that I found 
that's $4,000 that probably has 95% of what you need. So why don't you just buy that report instead? And then, you know, if you still need help, let me know, right? Um, and they went and bought yeah, the report. Exactly. And I'm waiting to hear back if they want some more help. But I think, you know, being willing to just walk away from things or recommend some other solution or someone else that's maybe more suited or lower cost builds builds that long-term trust. Yeah. Now, two things. One, I mean, to be fair, it's easy for, for Will, for you and for me to, to say that. We both have thriving practices and walking away is, is a little bit easier. That said, well, I don't know about your situation, but I, I was certainly in a situation early on where my practice was, was struggling right? and every dollar was meaningful and walking away was harder. And I would still say doing the right thing for the client and not being attached to every single opportunity gave me the freedom and the ability to win more business. When you're attached to every opportunity, when you're emotionally attached to everything, um, it's actually harder to win business. You, 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 it's, there's a level of desperation that clients can sense and that dis, uh, does you a disservice. Um, so I just one thing I want to mention. The other was that if I can kind of riff off this idea of preparation. Yeah, please do. I did a did an article recently where I talked about use your capabilities presentations and how much rabbit versus how much hat. <laughs> you know, because using magicians pulling rabbits from hats, and 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 often consultants go in with the, not only the hat, they go in with the full regalia of the magician. They've prepared everything and they have this huge deck of of slides that they want to present in a client meeting. So it's all had, it's all pre-done. It's all, you know, out there to see. And that's generally a mistake. What you want is the ability to pull the rabbits out as you need them, the right rabbit, if, if, if in fact it's a rabbit. You want to be prepared. And this is, by the way, is the same advice I, I gave to the folks going over to talk to the pharma firm um, when I was talking to them yesterday, is you, you should have some prepared. You need a little bit of hat. You need a little bit that's prepared and, and have done some of that research. Um, that little bit may simply be, here's what we think the purpose of today's uh, conversation is, what our meeting is about. Is this your objectives? Is what our objectives are? But almost everything else is there if you need it, but not if you don't. Meaning, oh, you would like to see a case study? Sure. We've got a case study. Let me just pull that up. Mm -hmm. Oh, you wanted to see our client list? Not a problem. I have a slide on that. But to have all of that built in advance, let me walk you through a case study. Let me walk you through the process because we've pre-prepared this. Makes your presentation uh, extremely fragile and, and uh, extremely likely to be uh, non-value added because it then becomes all about you. Here's what I want to present. I prepared this thing as opposed to being about the client. So it's no longer right side up. A right side up capabilities presentation, a right side up um, pursuit of an opportunity means you're prepared, but not um, pre-built. That makes sense? It, it does. It does. I mean, it's often super boring to look at a capabilities presentation. It's just, <laughs> it's boring, right? It's, it's like, okay, you know, there's lots of pages here. I can imagine that there's case studies and stuff and it just, it's just boring to listen to. You know, it's like reading 20 resumes or something, like every word. No one wants to do that. <laughs> you know. Yeah, and it's off topic. Right. It's upside down. Yeah. It's not about the client. It, it's a consultant talking about themselves. And if you've pre-built it, it's, it's almost necessarily about yourself. If you've pre-built a whole bunch of things that you don't feel compelled to present, then you can make it about the client. Yeah. You know, one, I think, area that is kind of neglected and just as we talk, talk, and talk about in, often in this is just follow up, you know, that uh, kind of st step one, follow up. Step two, repeat step one. It's just, um, <laughs> I, you know, I, I mean, I've, I've seen cases where I've followed up, you know, every week or 10 days. And, you know, nine months later, the client finally says, oh, you know what, actually, we're ready to get started now. So it can be annoying, but keep following up until the client says, just shut up and, and leave me alone you know, in a polite way, just like, hey, and then revary it up. Hey, just thought I'd check in. Um, you know, hey, any, any new developments? How's the thinking evolving? You know, come up with ways to, to vary it a little bit, but keep following up. Because sometimes, in, I think clients actually appreciate that, right? I mean, just if I think about my own life, there's 
stuff that I have on my to-do list that I want to do. And, you know, there's been cases where I've had maybe a craftsman uh, come to my house to, to look at something that probably needs fixed. And then I forget about it and they never come back and follow up, you know, but if they said, Hey, you know, your kitchen, you know, ceiling or something needs to be repaired. Have you thought, of, do you have the funds for that? Are you ready to do it? Do you want to do it while you're on vacation? You know, you, and then if they followed up, I'd probably say, Oh, thank you. You know, go ahead, do it. So following up on some, like having a tracking system, a CRM, and then just following up and continuing to reach out and check in. If you do that long enough time, eventually they'll either say like, stop bothering me, or at some point they might actually say yes. Right. And, and, and that goes back to how should clients choose a consultant and presented with the right consultant, right? With the right qualities, they will choose it. One is some persistence. Yeah. Some level of willingness to, to stay on it. That's an important quality in a consultant. The willingness to push back, to challenge assumptions, to challenge whether or not the project should be done at all to challenge the value, to all of that. That's highly valuable in a consultant. And if consultants are shy about pushing back, they'll actually win fewer projects than if they exhibit some independent thinking and some, some wherewithal to raise the client's thinking to a higher level. A, a, similar to what you just brought up in terms of just following up and perseverance, is responsiveness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Responsiveness absolutely rules in our business. And clients look to it. They, don't, they won't bring it up on their own because they don't know to bring it up. But if a client is thinking about working with a handful of different or three different consulting firms and they reach out to the different consulting firms and you call back within minutes, if you turn your proposal around within a day, Whereas other consulting firms are taking hours or days to return a phone call and weeks to return a proposal, you, you've got a huge step, uh, step up, leg up. You, I mean, you, you've got a huge advantage. So responsiveness is very, very important. Yeah. And, and of course, rapport. I mean, just being able to relate on a personal level, even though some of our work seems technical um, and depending on the kind of work you do, you may, it might be very analytical or may have a very technical side to it. We're dealing with people. This is a people business. It's people working with other people and being able to just be relatable um, and be interested, be likable. That, that stuff all has an impact on whether a client will choose you. What is your take, David, on free stuff? So doing a kind of offering a free workshop or a free you know, two-day diagnostic of your plant or... Ooh. You know, not offering to do the project for free, but offering to do, you know, something for free. I'm, I'm curious to hear kind of your, your thoughts on that. Well, I always prefer to be paid. <laughs> so that's a really interesting topic, Will. Um, in, in order of preference, my order of preference is highly paid, then free, and a very, very distant ninth is, is cheap. Yeah. So there's a big advantage to free versus cheap. Yep. And uh, I will, you know, I, you know, I don't, I don't do projects for for small fees. I'd rather do just do something. I'd just rather just say, you know, I'll just do it for you. I'll do it for free, or just turn it down and say when you're ready, or when you have the the wherewithal to to work with me, then then we'll we'll come together. Two days for free strikes me as as a little excessive, but a a free public session, for instance, or a free workshop where you can get multiple clients in to experience what you do, to get a taste of what you do, to get a sample or a pilot, um, that can be very powerful. Uh, and so I think giving people an experience of you is extremely important and uh, creates, again, that level of trust because now they've seen you, they see how you work, they've experienced you, they're getting a little bit of a taste of the results that you can create. And so that's extremely valuable. Uh, I, I, of course, I, I don't think most consultants that are listening, I have to convince them to don't do too much work for free because we're not building um, sort of philanthropic enterprises here, at least, you know, not professionally. You hopefully you create a lot of revenue and that gives you the opportunity to be uh, philanthropic if you want. So I don't think too many people are just going to volunteer all their work for free. Yeah. 
I don't think you but, should, but, uh, but it does. You, you know, on the flip on the flip side, though, well, just yeah. really quickly. Yeah. The I, I made an introduction between uh, two consultants yesterday, and uh, I just checked in on on one of them. I said, you know, is it okay if I make an introduction? And her response was, well, am I, am I going to get paid for this, or is this just you know fifteen minutes? And I, and and I thought that 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 was kind of um, surprising to me hmm. because I'll give anybody I give anybody a half an hour. I'll give them an hour. Um, of time for free because why not to to try to to monetize that one hour to me doesn't make sense and so just to build a relationship is worthwhile anyway so yep. i think we have to be careful especially people who work on an hourly basis which i don't but people you know think about every hour as if i have to sell this hour that that puts you in a in a position which i don't think is where you want to be for the long term yeah i agree with you i think you know on the doing stuff for free, it depends where you are with your practice, is my point of view, and what your opportunity costs are in terms of other stuff you could be doing. So when I was much earlier in my practice, there was one client where he hadn't used consultants before and was pretty kind of resistant to it or, you know, he was somewhat open but but re, but reluctant and the fees were kind of scaring him. So in that case, I offered, actually, I did a three-day free diagnostic, and then it took me about a day to write it up. So I invested that time in that, uh, and then I went with, you know, and then I went in on, on Friday and presented him the results, and that was, you know, sufficient to really get him over the hump and, you know, hired me for four or five months, and it turned out that he became a, you know, close client, a very close friend over the years, introduced me to other places. So that was turned out after the fact to be definitely worth worth the investment of time. In another case, I went and did like a one day free workshop for a client to say, hey, and it was a way of educating myself on their their problems, right? And what they were facing. And we got I got a clear sense of what, you know, what the project will look like. I wouldn't necessarily always do that, but I'd say small if you don't want to do it for free, then another option is to rather than to proposing the 12 week operational improvement is saying look just hire us you know a small bite you know just hire us for one week we'll come in we'll do a diagnostic we'll understand your issues we'll get you a sense of if we could be helpful or not so if you have a client that's having trouble kind of getting over the the hump of deciding making it really easy for them to say yes just you know hire me for one day or or two days or three days and then once they've invested in you then they're they're much less likely to go somewhere else right so you you reminded me of something which I really appreciate, and and I, and I wasn't equating some for some reason my own silliness free with sort of pro bono. The, I am a huge advocate for doing pro bono work, especially when you are starting or as you said when you've got a lot of capacity, because I do believe work begets business, um, work begets work, and so if there's a um, an organization, or if you're trying to build a new capability, if there's an organization that you you feel strongly about helping, I think that's great, and I think it it can jumpstart your practice. So that kind of pro bono work, I think, is, is very valuable. I'm I'm not 100% there on the do a small piece. Well, I think pilots can be very helpful, and pilots can be you know my idea of a pilot is 10% of the project for 15% of the fees, mm-hmm. <laughs> and you know, I'm finishing up a pilot right now, actually, with with a firm, where it was literally we we'll do a small version. We'll take one of your teams, and if it works in 2019, then we'll take a whole bunch of your teams in 2020. Right? So that's 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 what we're doing right now. We're finishing up. I, I've become slightly less enamored of, for instance, the we'll do the diagnostic, or we'll do the one day. So I do a number of one day you know trainings. I I, I push pretty hard to to not let a client go there. And the reason is my experience has been with, with my own work and with many of many of the firms I, I work with, their work, is that the ultimate value to the client is so much lower when the client does a little tiny taste mm. versus the whole meal. Um, it, you know, if you, if, you, if you just get one part of the appetizer, it's not like you're getting that you know, commensurate amount of the value of the whole meal and because the implementation isn't there the follow-on the long tail all the things that create value over time for a client and 
Um, as a result, uh, like I said, I've, I've become a little bit less enamored of that type of project. And I would rather tell a client, you know, um, we, if we're not right, we're not right. Then take the small project, which puts a little bit of cash in my pocket, gives them a little bit of value, but the value dissipates too quickly over time. Okay. So we've eaten up a lot of the time around how clients actually choose. <laughs> Share a few observations. Of, you know, people <laughs> go read the book, but how should <laughs> clients choose a consultant? Okay, well, we'll do this quickly. First, for, first foremost, they should uh, decide whether or not they should really be doing the project. So do a little bit of value work. Does it make sense to do the project? Second, they should put a little bit more thought into, should they be hiring someone from the outside or not? There's a should we, can we kind of trade off here. Um, can we do this ourselves and should we be doing it in house? And thinking that through will, will tell them whether they should be using a contract kind of labor or whether they should be using a consultant, whether they should be getting training or whether they should just be getting a project. Those are initial steps, which are particularly uh, important. Then they should be looking at outcome expertise. What outcome do we need? Not what situation are we in, but what outcome do we want and who's expert in that outcome? Um, and the difference between situation expertise and outcome expertise uh, can be subtle, but also can be striking. There was um, one quick example. This is going to date me, but years and years and years and years ago, I remember Charlie Daniels, who was a fiddler. He did um, Devil Comes Down to Georgia or something like that. <laughs> um, I don't remember the exact song. And he, he was really popular for a time. And he had a TV special. And so he's fiddling on his TV you know, special. And he had as a guest, Isaac Stern. Now, if you're, a, if you're saying, okay, I, uh, situation expertise, I want a country fiddler, right? I want someone who really knows country music and can fiddle and do that, right? That would lead you to Charlie Daniels. But when Isaac Stern went up there, and Isaac Stern, of course, is a, is a master violinist, right? One of the, the, the best ever. He was just, you know, fiddling for him. It was, it was nothing. It was child's play. And his ability to fiddle and to create music, which was the real outcome here, create pleasing country music was so far and above uh, what, what Charlie Daniels could do. It was amazing. Right? So what you're looking for is outcome expertise. That's what they should do. And that's what, uh, as a consultant, we need to show. It's not just that we worked in the, on the client situation, but we knew how to deliver the right outcome. So that's, that's a, a, a big piece of it. Um, and then some of those other things I, I talked about. They should be looking for willingness to push back. Clients should be looking for high responsiveness. They should be looking for rapport. And they should be looking for a return, not cost, but what's the return? Um, are you, are you uh, as a consultant, going to be able to create a higher likelihood of a higher value at the end? Because that's going to more than pay for an extra... 20000 or 200000 or, or whatever it is in, in fees. It justifies a fee premium. You know, then you're looking for, I think, things like um, good change plan because most consulting involves some change. So are you just going to suggest a change or as a, as, a, as a consultant, are you actually have experience and the ability to manage change? Are you going to provide a long tail of support? Do you have uh, some focus on risk and ways to manage risk? which very, very few clients uh, and, and very few consultants pay attention to. The few consultants that really pay attention to risk, here's what could go wrong in our project, and here's how we're going to make sure it doesn't go wrong, and here, by the way, is how we address anything that does go wrong. That gives um, Those consultants give so much reassurance to clients that they tend to win more projects, and, it's, and that is what clients should be looking for. Now, I didn't hear you mention references and reference checks how important is it do you think for clients to do reference checks i've you know some people would say they're worth nothing because you're always they're only going to recommend you know provide positive references but what do you think about yeah. reference checks i think that it doesn't hurt um i think that my assumption is in most cases as a client certainly and when i've as i've been looking for consultants for my my clients i'm talking to people that have a uh, you know, they're not fly by night anyway, that can, can show some roster of completed projects, ideally, and, and clients. And I think reference checks serve only m modest utility for exactly the reasons you mentioned. Because if I ask you who you've worked with or ask for some names, you're going to give me the names of people who are going to say glowing things about you. Now, if, if I can get references on you in a different way 
by asking indirectly, by looking at your client list and then talking to those clients myself, that is worthwhile. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I will advise clients to do that. And I've done that myself. Yeah. Or if the person, the consultant can't supply like a recent reference, like, oh, I have a glowing reference from 2004. It's probably not a good sign. <laughs> yeah. That might be problematic. Yeah. So I, I think asking for them is fine. I think they serve uh, somewhat marginal utility. Um, I'm, and I'm sure there are all sorts of listeners who will disagree vehemently with me, which is great, which is excellent. I mean, uh, everyone's experience is valuable. Well, David, we will include a link to your first book in the show notes for people that want to check that out. And I'm going to mangle the title. So it was Executive Guide to Choosing Clients. Consultants. Con- choosing Consultants. No, Executive Guide to Consultants was the first book. There we go. And uh, just as a fair warning, the Here's this book, Consultant's Guide to Winning Clients, um, which you've recommended many times, is a much more fun read. <laughs> <laughs> the Executive's Guide to Consultants is a very good book, but it's, 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 a, it's a more dense book. Yeah, I, I, maybe a second edition with, with more cartoons. <laughs> <laughs> it was before I was doing cartoons. All right. So, uh, illustration. All right, well, everyone, everyone listening should definitely... Go to your website, David, davidafields.com. Sign up for your weekly email. It comes out every Wednesday morning, which I love. It's always the first thing I read every Wednesday. And it's always great having you on the show. And I really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you so much for joining today. Thank you, Will. It's, it's always just a delight to, to just be able to discuss this with you and, and hopefully add value for your listeners. You certainly did. Hey, thanks a lot. Okay, bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Unleashed, the show that explores how to thrive as an independent professional. Unleashed is sponsored by Umbrex, the world's first global community of top-tier independent management consultants. The mission of Umbrex is to create opportunities for independent management consultants to meet, share lessons learned, and collaborate. I'd love to get your feedback and hear any questions that you'd like to see us answer on this show. You can email me at unleashed at umbrex.com. That's U-M-B-R-E-X.com. If you found anything on the show helpful, it would be a real gift if you would let a friend know about the show and take a minute to leave a review on iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher. And if you subscribe, our show will get delivered to your device every Monday. Our audio engineer is Dave Nelson. Our theme song was composed by Gary Negbauer. And I'm your host, Will Bachman. Thanks for listening.